So, the, um, so what we find uh, from all that is that the, uh, if, if we look at the solar radiation between the clearing and the forest, and I use something called leaf area index, which I, I'm not even going to define. If you work with it, you know it. But basically, if it's small, it's open. And if it's high, it's dense canopy. And it shows some canopy uh, photographs there to illustrate it on the chart. And basically, uh, what we find is that the uh, fraction of uh, shortwave radiation that hits the ground is, of course, close to one when we have a very open canopy. And it drops down to about 5% when we have a dense canopy, but there are substantial differences between the sunlit side and the shaded side. And so you can't map that out simply. You have to trace the solar radiation rays going through the canopy to calculate what's going on. So that's the solar radiation part. The other part of this are, is what's happening to, to the long wave radiation, the thermal infrared. The trees on the sunlit side are sitting there in the sun and they're heating up. And uh, during snow melt, we can get tree temperatures over 40 degrees Celsius on the trunks. And then they then emit tremendous amounts of long wave radiation, which melts snow around the trunks. If you ski, you know this, because you can fall onto these things and uh, break your leg. And, um, but it's also a great place to have lunch, if you're going to have lunch, is by one of these things. And the, um, so, so beyond all that, the, uh, the thing is that these, uh, this radiation from the trees has tremendous impact on the melt rates. And so we put all this into a model which calculates, using ray tracing techniques, the uh, uh, transmission of solar radiation through a very irregular canopy. And then uh, we have a, a finite difference thermodynamics model that I won't go into that calculates how quickly trunks and needles and stems heat up in the sun and how quickly they radiate out information. And from that, we can say something about the amount of radiation available for snowmelt in, uh, in gaps, and on the top two, are, we have uh, short wave radiation and long wave radiation uh, for a circular gap. And so you can see uh, where you uh, get lots of short wave radiation is where you don't get the long wave radiation. And the, so the lower chart shows where the energy is, at, uh, where the most energy is, and in fact, it's around the edge of the gap. And that's the, uh, the, that's the action point, and that's where the rapid snow melt's going to occur. So we can do it for a circular clearing, and we can do it for linear disturbances as well, uh, like this. And this allows us then to go into very detailed evaluation of various types of forest disturbances that might occur, and, the, um, and basically where, where are going to be the hot spots for snow melt rate variation. So that's all lovely, and if you, know, if you want to know how much uh, solar radiation there is by a particular tree, that's very useful. But how does that affect basin scale hydrology? You know, how does it affect us down in Calgary or places like this? And uh, so we can simplify those models and take them to a larger scale and look at the effect of forest gaps on radiation and slopes. And the, uh, here's the way to think of it. If you're on a south facing slope, we'll call it a hot hole. Uh, those are hot radiation gaps. They get lots of solar radiation. The trees heat up. Uh, pump out, and those are going to melt fast. And if they're on the north face, they're shaded from solar radiation. They're losing energy to the clear skies in the spring very rapidly, and they stay cold. And so we can start to look at the impact of forest disturbance on snowmelt rate that way. So we'll, tar we'll start with an intact forest in uh, Marmot Creek. And the, uh, you see the arrows pointing to the line of the amount of snowmelt that we would get off that forest as uh, um, in kilograms, basically millimeters water equivalent, and how quickly it melts. And so now we're going to do a, a computer-assisted clearing. And we're going to cut, uh, cut the forest on the north-facing slopes and create cold holes in the forest. And what we've done now is there's more snow to melt because there's less forest there, and we've slowed down the melt rate. And if that's your objective, then that's what you do. Okay. That's fine. So let's do something different. All right, now we've clear cut the south facing slopes and we've created hot holes over the canopy. We still have more snow to melt than we had originally because of the reduction forest canopy, but it's melting faster and the melt season is starting much earlier and much more rapid. And then let's cut a bit of both. Now we've cut both sides, we've increased the amount of snow to melt even more. And uh, we've not only started melt much earlier, but we're ending it much later. We've smoothed out the hydrograph. And th that might be an objective function for a watershed for uh, steady water supply coming out of it. But it, uh, 
Um, I'm not trying to ascribe any value to it. I'm just saying this is what happens. So now we could take this and put some scenarios together and this kind of information and say, well, let's look at um, various things that might happen to a forest. One would be pine beetle, another would be fire, another would be logging. And so I'm going to go through different scenarios and uh, go after all of Marmot Creek and say, what kind of response do we get from this? And just to remind you what Marmot Creek looks like again, remember we have the big clearings in Cabin Creek, we have the small ones in uh, Twin Creek, the small clearings, and the middle creek is left alone. And lodgepole pine is only at the lowest elevations where the driest uh, conditions occur in the watershed. Remember the snow and the rain are heaviest at the highest elevations in there. And so that's going to be important when we look at lodgepole pine impact. Okay, so this is the uh, impact of various types of forest disturbances on the volume of snowmelt water uh, that's coming out in the, in the uh, spring. So this is uh, what's leaving the snowpack. It's not necessarily forming stream flow. And that's important to consider. It might be recharging groundwater, might be sitting in local ponds and wetlands and then evaporating later on. It can be going into uh, replenishing soil moisture for the trees, but it's there. And uh, basically, as you uh, start to um, remove the forest cover, disturbing it, so the higher the number is, the more the forest cover is disturbed, and you can go up to 60%. That's how much of Marmot Creek is covered by forest. Then we get more snowmelt coming out of it. And uh, basically, no matter how you do it, you remove about 60% uh, of the, uh, well, you move all the forest, which is 60% of the basin, you'll get about 45% more snowmelt out of it. So it's following the physics that we'd expect from other parts of the world in that behavior due to the loss of interception. And, uh, but then you look at, say, what happens if we have pine beetle just remove the lodgepole pine? Well, lodgepole pine's at the lower part of the watershed. It's dry down there anyway. It's not contributing flow much of the time. And uh, it's only about 15% of the watershed. And so you get about a 5% increase in snowmelt. It's not much. So uh, that's not going to have an important impact on it. And then you could look at, well, what happens if we uh, have fire? We basically uh, leave the tree trunks there and that's it and don't disturb the soils. We see a slightly different behavior. Uh, we see the smallest impact uh, with trunk retention after a fire and uh, uh, say at about 35% uh, disturbance, uh, we get a 15% increase in melt. And we can double that to 30% increase if we have uh, clearings on south facing slopes. So where the, forest, or the trees are completely cleared away as opposed to leaving the trunk. So, um, so there are substantial differences in how the canopy is disturbed. And, and clearly in, the, in these uh, computer simulation examples, the uh, fire is not the same as forest clearing. And that neither is the same as pine beetle. And the impact of salvage logging is quite substantial. So we can take this to stream flow volume. And remember now, look at the graph we're seeing Pretty big amounts, right? Uh, 40, almost 50% impact on snowmelt. Um, look at the stream flow. It's vastly reduced. That's resiliency. The reason for this is that that snowmelt is occurring at different times. The more we remove the forest canopy, the more we desynchronize the delivery of water to the stream, the greater chance it has to recharge subsurface storage, soil and groundwater, and later evaporate out of the basin. And, the, uh, and so with the biggest disturbance we can put together, which is fire with retention of burned trunks, that's 60% of the basin effective. We only get an 8% increase in stream flow volume over the uh, summer into the fall period out of this, uh, which is uh, quite modest. And uh, for the pine beetle, we're, you know, we're looking at uh, increases in stream flow less than 2.5%. So that'd be hard to measure overall. The, um, and, the, uh, and of course, there's still important impacts uh, as to how you clear. Uh, the north facing slopes have a much greater impact on stream flow generation than clearing on south facing slopes does. So uh, uh, they're much more effective at getting water to the stream. Now, that stream flow over the year, what about peak stream flow? These aren't necessarily floods, but these are the high flow events every year. And those are important ecologically, and sometimes they are floods, so they're important that way as well. And this is simulation done before we had the flood meteorology in there. So it's not the 2013 flood, 
but we do get a uh, greater impact on peak stream flow with forest cover removal. You can get up to about 20, almost 25% increase in the peak um, in this case due to wetter soils, and, uh, but strong impacts due to changing uh, synchrony in the, in the melt. And so the, uh, uh, clearing the north facing slopes and, uh, um, can have a much greater impact than say the impact of pine beetle on the peak flows in there. But it's, it is possible to increase them quite easily into the 10 to 20% range with uh, uh, reasonable forest cover change. So that's what we know before the flood. Now let's get into the flood. So there we are. Um, that's the precip during the flood. Bullseye on the Kananaskis, uh, 250 to 350 millimeters of precip. It wasn't all rain. It turned to snow on the third day, and that uh, saved a lot of things in Calgary, I think. The uh, storing water is snow in the higher elevations rather than further rain onto what were at that point saturated soils. We know there's snow around as well from the U.S. National Weather Service. They have a product called SNODAS, the Snow Data Simulation System, and uh, you can see the U.S. boundary. They, they extend the analysis into Canada a little ways, um, and it does show that there is substantial mountain snowpack in the area, as do Alberta environment snow pillows. So we can look at the energetics of that snowmelt during the flood and say how much did the snowmelt contribute to the rainfall runoff that was causing so much trouble throughout the watershed. And the uh, interesting thing is that during the flood, remember this flood is occurring in the summer solstice, we often think of rain on snow floods as increasing the snowmelt rates and therefore substantially make, uh, increasing the peaks of the flood. But this is Alberta and we're different. So the, uh, because it's midsummer, the most important aspect of that rain on snow for snowmelt generation was that it was cloudy because solar radiation is the primary energy source for snowmelt. And so the snowmelt rates actually dropped during the flood and the additional energy carried by the, uh, it was kind of warm rain, um, didn't make up for the lock, last, uh, lost uh, solar radiation energy. And so the snowmelt rates slowed down during the flood and then accelerated again after it. And that was a uh, resiliency due to thermodynamics, which helped us out considerably uh, during that flood event. So there was a rain on snow component, but it was more muted than one would expect in the, uh, say, the BC coast or eastern, eastern Canada. The other thing is the, uh, we had a week of warm, uh, dry weather beforehand, and even the clearing soils, this is uh, that clearing where we had the big experiment at Marmot, started, the soil started to dry out the week before. And that meant that they had capacity to store rainwater um, during the first day of the flood, rather than uh, generating so much runoff. So yes, there was lots of runoff and stream flow generated within the first day, but an awful lot of it was stored in the subsurface as well. And I'll be getting into that in a second because that is absolutely critical. Remember, a tree can hold about two to maybe five millimeters of rain in its canopy. When 250 millimeters is coming down, the influence of the forest canopy itself is inconsequential. But soils can hold hundreds of millimeters of water. And, uh, and so whether that rain comes on dry soils or wet soils is very, very important. So we modeled this in the Alpine in various parts of Marmot Creek. And uh, the, on the upper right, you see a graph of soil moisture shooting up during the flood over most of the watershed, except in the alpine zone where it's thin, rocky, talus soils that don't hold very much. But those forest soils absorbed a tremendous amount of water. And uh, so that was very, very important. The, um, it also affected the mechanisms of runoff generation, and you can see in there that the LF, that's the level forest at the lower part of the L, uh, watershed, and UF is upper level forest, they were uh, very poor generators of runoff during the flood, which I think most people in Calgary say is a very good thing. So it's because they were storing it in their soils. Now we can look at the alpine zone as well and we see a shift there from subsurface flow, which is slow water percolation through the soil, to rapid overland flow over top of the soil that occurred in the alpine zone. This didn't occur anywhere else, and this meant that the alpine part of the watershed was the primary contributing area for the uh, flood peak waters that came through in Marmot Creek at least, where we can quantify this. So there's Marmot Creek on a nice summer day in 2004. Beautiful uh, little creek, nice weir set up down below this, and uh, 
here it is on uh, June 20th in 2013. There's a water survey of Canada gauge in there somewhere. And um, the other thing this tells you is that our students are insane. But the, um, uh, to be out there, but they were, uh, it was wonderful that we were able to get some information over the peak flows out of this when the, this sort of thing was happening. Of course, repeated all over the mountains. So the interesting thing, if you look at the uh, three-day amount of precipitation over Marmot Creek in that, and we have records from the Kananaskis Field Station going back in the late 30s and spotty records in Marmot Creek going back to the 1960s, we see that the uh, flood precip uh, uh, during the uh, 2013 flood was double the next highest measurement since the 1930s. So, that's, so you'd expect stream flow probably to be double the next highest uh, stream flow in that period of time. But it's not. The stream flow is resilient. It's only one third higher than the next. And that suggests again that the uh, watershed is not responding as dramatically to the extreme hydroclimatic event as, as one would expect in this case that it's expressing resiliency. So when we um, start to look at this in detail, we find that there's a relationship between the change in storage in the watershed and the flood generation efficiency. Flood generation efficiency of one means all the 250 millimeters of precip that comes in goes out. If it's less than one, that means it's holding back water. If it's more than one, that means snowmelt is adding water on top of that rainfall amount that's coming in. And so you can see in the alpine and the upper tree line areas, there's more water coming out than came into the watershed through rain. That's because of rain on snow onto the existing snowpacks. But at the lower elevations, and particularly the forested ones that you see in, uh, in, in uh, blue down there, there's a tremendous increase in storage, almost 100 millimeters of storage increase during the flood. And that's water that never made it to Calgary. So a uh, very important role of these uh, forest soils in promoting resiliency. And when we look at uh, antecedent conditions, we see a little bit hard to see, but the, uh, for some of you, but the lower left-hand corner, that's looking at antecedent previous soil moisture conditions, strong impact on flood generation efficiency. Uh, the air temperature is also important because warmer conditions beforehand generally mean drier soils. And uh, the amount of precip uh, before the flood also is important. Less precip means drier soils. So the answer is drier forest soils have a tremendous flood retention capability and that's something we need to look at. So we can go back to the model again and play a computer game. And in this game, we said, well, let's look at the flood of 2013. And um, the red is, uh, bl the blue line is with the current forest cover in Marmot Creek, about 60%. With the red line, we, in the computer model, we lobbed off all the canopies about three meters up ab above the ground and didn't touch the soils. And the red line and the blue line overlie each other almost perfectly during the flood peak no discernible impact whatsoever to forest canopy removal on the generation of that flood. But then the dark dash line, what it did there was compact the soils, reduce their storage capacity by half, which uh, might conceivably occur through um, um, uh, vehicles or industrial action on top of them or whatever. And you can double the flood peak in that case. So there is a resiliency to mountain watersheds it's associated with forests, but it's in the forest soils, not so much in the canopy as we might have thought before. So I'll leave you with a few conclusions uh, that you can read in the bottom one in green. Marmot Creek is resist, resilient to disturbance, but its resilience can be broken with a combination of canopy removal, soil disturbance, and extreme climate variability. And of course, uh, Bob Sanford said we're in the Anthropocene, so we're able to do all three of those. We're able to break Marmot Creek and other watersheds uh, in the Rockies. And I guess uh, we have to think about how we don't do that. So anyway, thank you.